So I'm Josh Prickett. Um, I went to school at A.T. Still University School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona. Uh, then I did my residency training at Virginia Tech in Roanoke, Virginia. And I'm finishing up a one-year fellowship in what we call skull base uh, neurosurgery, which is a, a specific type of neurosurgery where we focus on tumors, uh, mainly of the, of the base of the skull. Um, so it's been a, been a great year uh, here. Been, Finishing up, and then uh, not sure yet still uh, where I'm, where I'll be headed off to. Um, so I don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. Um, and I thought I'd start off uh, with, a, with a little case discussion. Uh, and you guys feel free to ask questions at any time um, and, and interrupt me. Um, so we start off with a 22-year-old male. Uh, he's out celebrating uh, because he just uh, took step one of his boards. Doesn't know if he passed or not, or not but uh, took a tumble down the stairs. And uh, when, when the EMS gets there, um, they find him uh, with a GCS of four. So he's decerebrate posturing, um, he's got agonal respirations, and he's got a left pupil that's not reacting uh, and, is, and is a little larger uh, than the right pupil. Anybody have any uh, suggestions of what might be going on? Uncle herniation, good. Somebody's been, you sure you don't wanna do a brain surgery? Um, so what are the first steps? What do, what do we want to do? This is, this is about burr hole, right? We want to drill a, drill a hole in his head, right? It's the first step. Anybody? Nope. So what are the first steps? Always go to the ABCs, right? And that should, that should always be your go-to. So establish airway, make sure the patient's breathing, make sure they've got a blood pressure that they have, you know, adequate circulation, and then drill, right? No, actually, it's disability. Um, so... I want to talk a little bit about the differences between the two major types of traumatic hematomas and the two that you might encounter and, and need to do a burr hole for. Um, so on the left side of the screen, um, you can see this nice biconvex lentiform uh, acute epidural hematoma. And you can see it's pushing on the brain and, and pushing the brain over, what we call midline shift uh, or subphalcine herniation. Um, the picture in the middle is actually kind of unique because you've got an epidural on the left and then this other hematoma on the right, which is a subdural hematoma. And so on the right side of the screen, uh, we see this crescentic, uh, you know, shaped uh, acute hematoma also with some, with some pressure and some midline shift. Um, does anybody know why the two are shaped differently based off of where they are on the dura? Mm-hmm. Well, sort of. So epidurals are, are typically arterial bleeding, but there's a reason why they make that biconvex shape and why they can't go around the whole convexity. Yes, sir? Uh, right. Perfect. So the dura is really stuck at those sutures. So it'll, you know, under arterial pressure, it'll dissect, but it won't, won't continue to separate it from the skull at those suture points. Versus a subdural below the dura is freely going to bleed into that entire space and make that more crescentic shape. So we'll do some quick anatomy. Um, the thinnest portion of the skull is what's called the squamous portion. So can you all see the arrow there? It's kind of small on the screen. So we've got the petrous portion, which I'm interested in as a skull base surgeon, the mastoid portion, and then this is the squamous portion. So again, the thinnest portion of the, of the skull is right there in front of your ear. So it's actually the most uh, common uh, area to get a skull fracture with blunt force trauma. Uh, so, and unfortunately, right in that spot where it's the thinnest, we have this artery running on the inside. Um, and you can see even on the right side of the screen, you see the indentation in the skull where, where this artery grows into the skull. Um, and then you see it there in the middle, kind of you know, adherent to the dura there. Anybody know the name of the artery? Nope, speak up. No wallflowers. Hmm? Middle meningeal artery, perfect. So somebody mentioned this earlier. They said uncle herniation. Um, so we see, again, there's a little, little hint down at, the, down at the bottom. What does uncle herniation lead to? Compression of cranial nerve three, correct, which is an oculomotor nerve palsy, right? 
So that would cause a pupil that's deviated uh, infralaterally, uh, as well as doesn't react to light. Um, so that brings up the, an old adage that a, that a mentor of mine in Alabama taught me. He said, drill on the side of the pupil, because when he trained, we didn't have all these fancy MRI scans and, and certainly not access to the CT scanner that we have now. And so they'd have a patient come in with a, with a blown pupil, you'll hear people talk about, um, and that was where they started with, you know, with the burr hole on that side. Um, so indications for a burr hole. For neurosurgeons, we typically would use it to evacuate a chronic subdural. So you see on the CT scan there, you see that kind of double fluid where there's some thinner fluid and then some collecting of thicker, more proteinaceous old blood fluid, probably at least two weeks old, um, on both sides there. And so that's pretty common in the elderly as the brain atrophies, stretches those bridging veins. Even a simple, small torsional event can cause bleeding into the space and a collection of blood that if it reaches a certain size or is causing pressure problems and symptoms attributed to it, we would go in and, and evacuate it. Indications for pretty much anyone else uh, is gonna be you know, kind of a last ditch salvage you know, emergency effort um, when you don't have access to a CT scanner or a neurosurgeon. You know, someone is actively herniating and dying in front of you and you suspect that they have an epidural or a subdural hematoma. As you can see on the screen on the right, that's what acute epidural or subdural hematoma looks like. It's thick, gelatinous clot. And so you're not gonna get it all out through a burr hole. So if, if I'm going to go remove a large, you know, acute hematoma, I'm gonna do a craniotomy. I'm gonna do several burr holes, connect them to make a window of bone that I can then remove the thick clot that sometimes you have to actually scrape and, and remove off of the brain to get it out. Um, versus the chronic, which is more like motor oil fluid, which will just kind of wash out once you, once you open the burr holes. So, um, the locations for these exploratory burr holes, um, usually you would start with a, with a low temporal, um, just because that's the area that's gonna be most prone to compression and uncle herniation. Uh, and, and you can decompress the brain stem and that third nerve, which is the, the most imminent threat to life. Um, so about two centimeters in front of the tragus of the ear, that's to, to avoid the frontalis branch of the facial nerve, um, and then about a centimeter or two above the zygoma. And you, everybody can feel their zygoma there, and you can feel there's a little indentation just, just above it and just in front of the ear. And that's kind of the area where a, where a typical temporal burr hole to decompress the middle fossa uh, would go. And then, uh, basically, the area you want to avoid doing a burr hole is over the motor strip, you know, um, because you can you know, injure it and cause weakness. So a good landmark for that is the coronal suture, or four to five centimeters behind that. So if you go just in front of that coronal suture, it is a good place for a frontal burr hole. And then a good six to seven centimeters well behind uh, the coronal suture is a good place to do your parietal burr hole. <laughs> Uh, also, another landmark for the parietal is the, the protuberance back there we call the parietal boss. So that, you know, most prominent area at the back. So various methods for, uh, for making a burr hole or doing a craniostomy. Um, down at the bottom is the uh, uh, hand trephine, um, kind of archaic looking. On the left uh, is what's called a Hudson brace, uh, which was one of the early uh, tools. Uh, used and then modern neurosurgeons typically use either a pneumatic or an electric drill that you see there on the right. And today we're going to use a hand drill. Now, neurosurgeons do still use this, uh, it's just used really at the bedside in an emergency situation, usually to drill a burr hole to, to place a ventriculostomy. Um, what I don't want to see is anybody on the news trying this with their DeWalt at home. So the method, um, you need to start with a small skin incision uh, just to get, get down to the skull. And the, the scalp can be rather thick and actually rather, rather bloody. So if you have the time, uh, you can use some local anesthetic uh, in order to help with the bleeding. And a small self-retaining retractor that usually comes in the kits can be helpful both to get you access to the skull and control bleeding while you're doing the procedure. <clears throat> 
Um, so you want to hold the drill firmly against the skull and kind of spin a little bit, kind of back and forth. And that's to kind of scratch the surface of the, the skull and get you started. Otherwise, if you just start drilling, you'll probably skive off. Um, so it does, get, it does take some force. Um, and you'll see, you see on the CT scan there and the inset, there's actually really three layers of bone that you're gonna go through. So there's a very hard outer table that you're gonna feel as you're starting. Then it's gonna become a lot easier to drill as you're going through the um, cancellus diploe. Um, so it'll kind of just chew through that. And then you'll get to another area where it becomes more hard. That's that inner table, uh, the cortical bone again. Down in the temporal region, however, it's really only the cortical bone. So it's, so it's pretty much really thin and easy to, easy to just bust through. Um, so let's see. Some tips, um, stay perpendicular. Um, you know, any, any point uh, perpendicular to the skull will get you down to the ventricles, which is usually what, what you end up doing for a ventriculostomy, which is why neurosurgeons would do this. Um, and it also just, just helps with uh, drainage. So you don't wanna take the plunge. Um, when you get to that inner table, if you just kept pushing and drilling through, you would push on through. Now there's a little, there's a little stop here, the little guy that'll, that'll kind of catch it, but it won't protect the brain in the end. And, and you often see, you know, when you're training junior residents and, and they're, they're drilling along, they'll often plunge the first time and then they remember it for forever. Uh, hopefully you don't harm the patient. Um, but so I'll, I'll kind of show you all in the lab how at the end it's a, it's a gentle, almost kind of, you know, pushing it through without plunging through that inner table. Um, you want to open the dura sharply because again, you've gotten through the skull and you're in the epidural space. Um, if you just pushed on the dura, then you could start actually dissecting the dura away from the skull, collect blood and, and cause an epidural hematoma. So you want to open that sharply then using like an 11 blade or a spinal needle. Um, in the field or, or in the ER, if you're doing this in an emergency situation, if you're not a neurosurgeon, I would not recommend blindly sticking instruments in, trying to get clot out, uh, or trying to suction uh, blindly without being able to see or have a larger hole. And the reason is just because you can injure the brain or you might not be in the right, the right spot. Um, if the blood clot is under pressure, the patient is herniating and dying, it will shoot out of the hole if it needs to come out. So that's the fun stuff, the, the burr hole. Um, we can talk a little bit about the occipital nerve block as well, which is probably a procedure that y'all would more commonly run into, especially if you're in uh, family medicine or internal medicine, uh, certainly neurology. Um, some of the indications, um, occipital migraines. Um, you can get cervical spondylosis, where you get direct compression of that C2 nerve root and can cause pain in that distribution, or what we call occipital neuralgia, just a kind of uh, general term for, for neuropathic pain in the distribution of C2. So the occipital nerve uh, provides the sensation to that back and top of the head, uh, as opposed to you know, the terminal branches of the trigeminal nerve that, that provide to the face, right? V1, two, and three. Um, this is really the C2 dermatomal distribution made up of the greater and lesser occipital nerves. Um, the greater occipital nerve uh, is primarily the dorsal ramus of C2, um, and the lesser occipital nerve uh, is the, the ventral rami of C2 and C3. Uh, keep in mind that C1 really doesn't have much of a sensory component, and there's not an actual dermatomal distribution for C1. Um, so we see on the diagram on the left there, we see the greater occipital nerve coming up, showing the C2 dermatome in green there. Um, slightly different picture here. Again, that greater occipital nerve coming off of C2. Lesser occipital nerve, more lateral, uh, and a little smaller area, kind of more, more behind the ear. Um, and we see the occipital artery that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, as well as some other structures that we want to know where they are and avoid. And those are the foramen magnum with the cervical spinal cord and the brainstem, as well as the vertebral artery that's exiting the vertebral foramen and going through the sulcus arteriosus, looping over the arch of C1 before it becomes intradural. Uh, 
So for landmarks for an occipital nerve block, uh, your main one is your inion, or your external occipital protuberance, and everybody can feel theirs in the back, knows where it is. You go about two centimeters lateral to that and two centimeters inferior to that. And if you were just doing, you know, just a blind in, in infiltration of the region, trying to get a general nerve block of that vicinity, you could just use those landmarks. Um, you can also use ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is mainly useful to find the occipital artery, and then based off of that, keeping in mind that the greater occipital nerve is just medial to, and the lesser is just lateral to, you can use that as a guide uh, for your injection. You can also use Tennell's test, where you actually tap along the, where you, ex you expect the nerve to be, and you can actually get reproduction of that neuropathic pain into the distribution. That's both an indicator that, that a procedure would help uh, with it, and also you can tap along it and mark it on the scalp you know, th where the nerve is actually going to tailor your injection. So the technique, um, you want five to 10 cc's of both a long-acting anesthetic and then a long-acting steroid. So a lot of people use bupivacaine and Depomedrol. Uh, is a common one. You want a small needle, you know, 22 gauge is usually pretty good, and you don't need it to be particularly long, really just enough to get through the, through the scalp. You want to prep the entry site and always use sterile technique. Um, you want to avoid aiming inferiorly. Again, we want to avoid the foramen magnum, we want to avoid the vertebral artery. Um, and you don't want to go too medial, because if you end up too medial, you're actually going to miss, miss the greater occipital nerve. So you always want to aspirate. Anytime you're doing an injection, um, you, know, you go in with the needle, you always aspirate back because there's actually two other spaces you could be in. One is the occipital artery, which if you directly injected that into it would, would be a problem. The other is the foramen magnum. So you could actually do, you know, accidentally do a, a you know, what we call a cisternal puncture and end up in the subarachnoid space um, if you injected um, lidocaine directly into the spinal fluid there, the patient would numb all their cranial nerves and lose consciousness, um, which I actually saw in a patient who was sitting up one time. Didn't, didn't you know, was not the thing to do. Um, so you want to insert, again, aiming more kind of superiorly from that two centimeter, two centimeter point. You go until you hit the occipital bone, then you want to aspirate retract slightly and then aim a little bit more superiorly. Again, aspirate, and then when you think you're in the right spot, inject the anesthetic. Um, when you're done, or actually during the injection, you may actually hit the nerve and they'll, they'll feel the reproduction of pain. That actually just means that you're in the right spot and it's a good, good prognostic sign that it, that it will improve. Um, so then after, you're, after you've injected it slowly, you remove the needle and hold pressure to prevent a hematoma from forming. So here's a little picture of it. Again, that you know, two centimeters lateral to the external occipital protuberance is the greater occipital nerve, which is medial to that occipital artery you want to avoid. And so about you know, another two centimeters lateral to the artery is the lesser occipital. Um, so. Any questions?